Okay. So, <coughs> so this was a re restriction fragment analysis. And so, um, basically, uh, like it's a way to compare different sources of DNA. So, for instance, we're all humans. We have certain genes in common. Like, so for, for instance, all of us are able to make hemoglobin, which is a protein in our red blood cells that allows us to deliver oxygen to our cells. So therefore, we all have that gene in common, and the sequence of that gene is pretty much the same between all of us. So some of our, our DNA is identical because we make identical proteins to do certain jobs. But then some of our DNA is not identical, and it's those differences that make us different. So we have the so that's why we all look differently, we act differently, we have different um, traits and so on. So, so some of it definitely is different. What makes it different is the order of, what do you think? The bases, all right, uh, A's, T's, C's, and G's. And so what this does, this restriction fragment analysis, is allows us um, to, what we do is we take um, different people's DNA or different organisms' DNA, I'm just gonna use people as an example, and we um, uh, use restriction, restriction enzymes to cut up the people's DNA. So we could take, let's say, any three people in here, um, let's say extract some blood, get some DNA out of a, a cell in your blood, and use the same restriction enzyme on three different people to cut up. Remember, restriction enzymes, what do they do? I'll look this up from last hour here. They look for a specific sequence. So let's say CCGG, and it's the same this way. Um, uh, from right to left, and so then it looks for that sequence and then cuts in, let's say, between the two C's. So that's where we get that jagged cut that creates the sticky ends. So because different people's DNA have different sequences, do you think that they're gonna have the exact same number of cutting sites? Most likely not. So some people may have more of this sequence than others, and so therefore people's DNA will cut at different spots. And so therefore, that in, therein lies the, the, the basis for this um, thing called gel electrophoresis, where we analyze, it's an indirect method of rapidly analyzing and comparing genomes, gel electrophoresis. It uses a gel as a molecular sieve to separate nucleic acids or proteins by size. And so, what's a sieve? The molecular sieve. It separates things can be sub, uh, on size. Like so, I mean, something you're probably familiar with is like a, you know a strainer to for spaghetti. All right. So if you put a bunch of dirt in there, the sand would go through and the rocks and things like that would stay, right? That's a sieve, all right? And so, so this gel um, acts as a sieve and separates fragments of DNA based upon size. So let me ex illustrate that for you. So what we have here, here's this gel. And this gel, uh, uh, it's a little thicker, kind of denser than the auger, but, um, but it, it's still kind of squishy. And this gel, what it has in it is molecular, very small little pores or holes in the gel. So what this allows us to do is to analyze DNA. So let's pretend that these are three different people. So these are people, in the inside of these is their DNA molecules. So now it says, look at what it says there, mixture of DNA molecule of different sizes. How do we get different sizes? All of these so let's say three people in here, we take your DNA and we cut with the same restriction enzyme. And that's how we get it in different sizes. So let me illustrate for you. So if this is person number one and this is person number one's DNA, so that, that restriction enzyme is looking for let's say CCGG as a cutting site. And let's say on this fragment of DNA, here this piece of DNA, that this person has two cutting sites. And so therefore you have three fragments. And then person number two, their DNA may have, let's say they have the same cutting site, but then they might have two others, all right, that are different. And so, <clears throat> because the order of bases are different, so they have that CCGG um, two more times. And then person number three, their DNA 
might only have a coming site right here and just have one of them. And so, <clears throat> so when you're using the same restriction enzyme to cut up people's DNA, you get these different sized fragments. And so that's what this means. So this person number one, two, and three. So then <clears throat> what we do is we mix the DNA in a fluid and we put some of that fluid into these indentations, they call them wells on the gel. And so it has a solution, but it also has these different sized fragments in here from the different people. So then <clears throat> what happens next is they hook this up to a power source and allow electricity to run through. So the current, so there's an actual current that runs in this direction from the wells to the end. So this is the negative end, cathode, and positive anode, and you have this electricity running through. Now, why is that important? The th why that's important is because DNA molecules are negatively charged. What do opposites do? Attract, right? So these molecules, these fragments of DNA, because there's electrical charge here and this is the positive end, that DNA is going to want to move towards that positive end because DNA is negatively charged, opposites attract. So how does it move through there? There are, some, what you can't see here is in this gel, there are small little holes. So, um, and so what those, that DNA does is begin to move through those little holes. So if I'm a fragment of DNA, all right, so I'm right here looking down, so that in front of me is the gel. I'm gonna, there's these small little holes, and I'm gonna start to move through those little holes and through the DNA, or through the gel, down towards that positive. So it's like wiggling through there. Does that make sense? All right, follow me. So then what happens is, is because you have a whole bunch of different sized fragments, some small, some large, they don't travel at equal rates. Who's gonna have a harder time, do you think, getting through? The larger ones, the larger ones, it takes a little bit more time to get through the pores and so on because they're so big. The smaller ones can move at a faster rate. So what happens is if you put the DNA in these wells and then turn on the electricity and run this for 20 minutes, that means that all the DNA has equal time. What's going to happen is the DNA in this well is going to start moving through the pores and separate based upon size. And that's what you see here. So therefore, the larger molecules are going to kind of get stuck um, towards the uh, closer towards the well. Shorter molecules are going to move fastest in that same amount of time. Now, if you let it run forever, would these larger molecules eventually get to the end? Absolutely, they would. These guys would run right off the gel. All right, if you did. So, you, so therefore, you run run it for a shorter amount of time, and so you get the separation for based upon size. And the thing is, is that then. You can't see the DNA, so we dye it, and you can see the bands, and each one of these represents a different sized fragment in the person's DNA. And what this allows you to do is compare DNA sources and, and so on. So, so what happens is, is that no two people will have the exact same pattern unless you're identical twins, all right? And so, so this is sometimes called a DNA fingerprint, all right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's unique to um, one particular person. And so, um, so a, 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 an application of this is, here's a criminal case here where you have a defendant and a victim. And so what this box here is supposed to be showing you, this is the gel. And what they did, you had, you had five wells because we have five different samples of DNA. So what they did is they took and ran the defendant's blood and DNA from found uh, the defendant's blood. And then they took, they found three samples of blood from the defendant's clothes. So one sample from the jeans, one, two samples from um, their shirt. So two different samples, and then they ran it against the victim's blood here, and so um, in the DNA for the victim. And so, what does this tell us about the defendant? Does it look good for the defendant? Does it look good for the defendant or not? No. What, can somebody tell me why it doesn't look so good for the defendant? Lucas. That's right. So the, the banding pattern here for the different sized fragments of DNA is the same as the two uh, that are found on the 
defendant's shirt. And so therefore, what this is saying is that the defendant had the victim's blood on his or her shirt. All right, and so then it looks like they also have somebody else's blood on here because this doesn't match either theirs or the victims, right? So there's some other source as well. So that's another puzzle to be solved. All right, but but uh, uh, but, but uh, that would be a piece of evidence against the defendant. Now, does it prove that the, the, the defendant is guilty? No, it doesn't prove that. No, so you treat the DNA with restriction enzymes before you ever put it into this well. So you take the DNA, so I isolate the DNA from you, isolate the DNA from coal, all right, and, and so on, and then treat it with the same restriction enzymes. So the restriction enzymes cutting your DNA, cutting your DNA, but because your DNA is not identical, you're going to have different amounts of cutting sites, which means that you have different size fragments. Then you put it into the wells. And the gel is just to used to separate out the sizes of DNA. So you don't have to use that kind of thing multiple things instead of the gel? Because what the gel have that comes across the other network for the That's what I have. It's just it's like the analogy, it's like a sieve. Alright, so it's really separating DNA out based on size. That's what it's job. That's doing nothing else. It's not doing anything to the DNA. It's not reacting any way to the DNA. It's just separating it out. Okay. Um, so when when like someone says uh, like chimpanzees have ninety nine percent identical DNA to humans, they're talking about the sequence or like the cutting sites or the are they sequence. okay? The sequence. Okay. Yes. The sequence. Yes. Right. yes. Yes. And so it's amazing that one percent of the cats are still. Small portion, but it yeah, has a lot. It, it, it uh, codes for a lot. <laughs> okay. So in restriction fragment analysis, DNA fragments produced by restriction enzyme digestion of a DNA molecule are sorted by gel electrophoresis. So that's this is just the sorting process, and allows us to compare. And so, so crime scene analysis is one way, that one useful feature. Another way is to um, uh, compare two different uh, alleles of a gene. So I want to give you another example with gel electrophoresis here, another use for it besides in a crime scene thing. You can also use gel electrophoresis for paternity testing to run um, uh, uh, what you do if for paternity testing is you run a gel uh, and a, a baby would have part of the DNA from mom, part of the DNA from dad. You get your half the DNA from mom and dad. So with paternity testing, you could run, um, going back to this, and so you could have mom, dad, baby and do the same thing and baby should have a combination. All the bands in baby should either be in mom or dad. Does that make sense? And so if the, the father has bands um, that, and, and the, one of the, the bands is not found in his mom or the dad, then that probably tells you that the dad is not the dad. All right? All right? It's never a question usually of who's the mom. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we know for sure who the mom is. Oh, All right? It's the dad that's usually in the question. So that's how you can do paternity. Um, so another way to do this is, um, I'm gonna use the sickle cell trait again. Remember sickle cell, your little r, little r, you have sickle cell disease. But if you are big r, big r, or big r, little r, you do not have, so you don't have, um, have the disease. So, so remember that you can't tell the difference between if you're big R, big R, or big R, little R by looking at you. You just know you don't have the disease. And so when we talked about with genetics with animals or plants, we said, oh, you could do a test cross and, and, and cross it with a homozygous recessive and see. Um, and so on. that's not ethical for humans to do that. So therefore, as a human, um, this is one way that we can detect, let's say, if you want to know if you are a carrier of a disease. So what we have to do is know a little bit about the genes. And so this is the normal hemoglobin gene. So this is normal. So this is like the big R. 
and this is the sickle cell gene, this is like the little r. Sickle cell, the gene, is caused by one mutation, it's a point mutation, one single base is changed. And so let's see how this works. So the normal gene, if, if we use this right here, is a restriction enzyme. So we use the same restriction enzyme. So notice here, DDEL, DDEL, we're using the same restriction enzyme to cut up the, the genes. And so what happens is, in a normal gene, these right here are your cutting sites, right here. So those are, so it cuts four times. And then notice though, if somebody has the sickle cell gene, the one mutation in the sickle cell gene actually occurs at this cutting site. So what happens is, if this enzyme is looking for the sequence CCGG and cuts between the Cs, if the, it's a, there's a mutation, and we have now a T and an A, is the enzyme gonna recognize that? No, and so what happens here is notice here, there's no cutting site. And that's because of the mutation. And so then you have one fewer cutting site and therefore when you use that same restriction enzyme, we only get two fragments instead of three. So then what happens is, let's say that, let's call this fragment A, B, and C. So here's A, B, and C. If we take that, those fragments and put it in the well and run gel electrophoresis, they're gonna be separate based upon size. And notice that there are three lines here. Which fragment out of my A, B, and C would be first, this first line B? It would be A, B, or C? C. C, right, the larger fragment. And then what would be next? B is slightly larger than A, you see that? B is slightly larger than A, so this would be B and A, but notice that they're close, so therefore they're, the lines are, are around the same area here. All right, so that's what a normal allele looks like. A sickle cell allele here doesn't have a cutting site, so now we only have two fragments. I'm gonna call this fragment D and fragment E. Fragment E, Notice that that mutation didn't affect this, so therefore they have the same large fragment as somebody who doesn't, uh, has the normal gene here, so that would be E right here, so that's why the lines are in the same, because it's the same size. But then, instead of having two smaller fragments, since we don't have a cutting site, we have a bigger fragment, and so, and that bigger fragment is bigger than A or B, so it's a little bit, didn't travel quite as far in the gel. And so what happens is, is that if, you t if, like, let's say I didn't know if I was a carrier for sickle cell, all right? So I don't know if I'm big R, big R, or big R, little R. So if I were to run the gel here for myself, so this is my well here, and so this is my DNA. If I'm big R, little R, so let's say I have both of my alleles in there. So I have, if I'm big R, little R, I would have the, the, I'd have a big R, so I'd have those three. I'd have C, B, and A. But my second allele, let's say, is a little r. So I'd have, look a little bit thicker here. I'd also have fragment E, which is in the same spot here. And I'd have fragment D as well. Does that make sense? Like, so I, because I have two genes. So if I cut up my two genes, if I don't separate them. All right. And so, and then if I ran my DNA and I didn't have this band, that would mean I'm big R, big R. Okay, so I didn't have a little r. Okay, and that's one way that you can tell. So you're looking for basically this band, and if you have it, then you're a carrier. If you don't, you're not. All right, so that's another application. So they call these uh, fragments rifflips, restriction fragment length polymorphisms. There's these differences that people have in their sequences of DNA and therefore makes fragments of different lengths. And it's due to those, those differences that we have that allows the, the DNA to separate differently in our gel electrophoresis. All right, did I go too fast? Yeah. yeah.
think in biology they, they taught about this in Human Genome Project. So I just wanted to just quickly just mention that um, where we have mapped the human genome, um, we sequenced it, which means uh, that we they figured out the order of the bases, A's, T's, C's, and G's, completed by 2003. Uh, even before the humans, lots of other organisms were done first, smaller organisms, and they're still sequencing other organisms. And so once you get the order of bases and the sequencing, then you can work on individual genes and look at and um, study individual genes um, and so on. So, so the Human Genome Project was a really big deal um, to, to be able to do that and um, open up a door in the study. Very Yeah, but the, the amount is very oh. small. So think about 1% between you know, humans and chimpanzees. I'm not sure exactly what the percentage is that's different between humans and human, but it's really small. All right, so, so yeah, there is some differences, but the majority, we have a lot of genes in common, okay. you and I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this last little bit is just, I wanted to just talk about um, some applications. So, so the gel electrophoresis was the last like technical, you know, about DNA technology. And so, this is more just some of the things we use DNA technology for. And so, diagnosing diseases. study it to see as long as you know what the viral DNA the sequence of the viral DNA you can look for that in the human DNA and therefore diagnose diseases based upon if they have the, the actual um, DNA in there um, gene therapy uh, they've been working on this and we have a picture here that this is this picture here um, gene therapy they try remember if you have a genetic disease um, there's no cure because you have genes that you inherited from your parents. And so the only way to fix a genetic disease is to fix your genes or give you a gene that you don't have. So if you're little r, little r, you need a big r gene to produce the protein. And um, otherwise, then we can just treat the symptoms. And so this is an example they've done with bone marrow. Uh, a way to fix, like let's say in the cells that bone marrow makes on your uh, blood cells, and so let's say you're little r, little r, and you have a genetic disorder in, um, in, and it, that affects your um, red blood cells, let's say. And so, <clears throat> so what happens is, right now we can do a bone marrow transplant where somebody else, you, get, you can transplant their bone marrow as long as you're a match from the whole immune thing and then, um, uh, and then put it into you. So that right now that's what you can do. They're working on 
uh, doing where you actually inject the normal allele into the person. So let's say this is the RNA for the big R gene. So what they do is they use a retrovirus and they take some of the viral RNA and they put this big R gene into the viral RNA. They do get rid of the, the part that would make you sick. The, the, they don't let the virus like infect you and give you some kind of disease. All right, but they use what retroviruses do. Um, what do what retroviruses do? They infect a cell. So what they do, if I had, if I, instead of getting a bone marrow transplant, you could take my bone marrow out. So some of my cells in my bone marrow. So that's what this is here. Take this engineered retrovirus with the big R that I don't have and let the retrovirus infect my bone marrow cells in the lab. The retrovirus infects it. What do retroviruses do? They insert their DNA into the host cell's DNA. So now in my bone marrow cell, I now in my DNA in that bone marrow cell, I have a big R. Then they actually put your own this genetically engineered bone marrow cells that originally came from you. They now have the big R gene they inject them back into you, let them replicate, and the hopes is that now you have the big R gene and can be making the protein that you were deficient in in the first place. Does that make sense? All right, and so therefore, that's gene therapy. It has not been wildly successful on um, the gene therapy, but it's still um, being um, researched and things like that. So, so that's a, a big area of research is human gene therapy. It's a, um, promising to help cure genetic diseases. Um, let's see, we've already talked about pharmaceutical production, making insulin or human growth hormone, like in bacteria. We just talked about forensics and paternity. Environmental cleanup, they genetically engineered bacteria where they put into the bacteria a gene that allows the bacteria to produce an enzyme that actually metabolizes and breaks down pollutants in the environment. So, um, so one is like for petroleum products, like oil. So they're working on like trying to um, use those bacteria to clean up oil spills and things like that. So that's another example of a practical application. And then uh, the transgenic organisms, we, have, we, we did this in the, the lab. We actually made transgenic organisms the bacteria that we made are transgenic, introducing genes from one species into the genome of another organism. And so that's what we did. We put the jellyfish gene into a bacteria, and so we made a transgenic organism. Um, sometimes these are called genetically modified organisms. You, have you guys heard of that? GMOs, all right? It's in the news a lot, um, very controversial um, about uh, uh, whether or not we should be doing that or not. We are doing it, but it's controversial as far as why or if we should. Some of the things that we've done, um, besides bacteria, we've made lots of transgenic bacteria, we've made transgenic animals. So the example I gave here is uh, a goat. Some people, there's this this protein called antithrombin, it's a blood protein, human blood protein. Some people have a mutation in the gene to make that protein, so they're deficient in it. So what we've done is we've taken that human gene that makes this protein and inserted it and put it into the goat's DNA. The goat then makes the protein. The protein gets deposited in the goat milk. People can drink the goat milk and get the protein that they're deficient in. Makes sense, all right? All right, so, so that's a transgenic animal. Um, a transgenic plant, Bt corn, this is based upon the bacteria that they got the gene out of. Um, this is, uh, these are plants that have a gene that was once found in the bacteria in the, the corn. There are lots of Bt plants. Corn is just one example. They've done this with lots of different species of plants. But what it does is allow the plant to produce a molecule that um, acts as a natural kind of insecticide, which means that insects won't eat it, and that's good for the farmers, all right? So the farmers don't spray, don't spend, you know, spend lots of money on that. Um, a golden rice is, uh, let me show, show you a picture here. This is normal rice on the left, that's the wild type. Golden rice is they uh, put a gene into rice that allow the rice to make beta carotene. Um, there are certain populations in the world that are deficient in beta carotene, um, which is an essential nutrient. So what they've done is they genetically engineered rice, which is, so you can grow lots of it, 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 it's pretty cheap, and you mix this beta carotene, and then you can feed the people who are deficient in this, this rice, and they get what they're missing um, through the rice, all right? And so, so it's a way to fill a nutritional gap 
um, uh, like I said, pretty easily and pretty cheaply. Um, all of this, making these genetically modified organisms, I said that it's controversial. Why would that be? Okay. Yeah. Some people think think that there's not really. I don't know that. Um, so the, so there's not been studies done. All right. As far as the overall long term health effects. Um, and so so looking at uh, you know when we genetically modify organisms um, when we eat it is that going to have a health effect on us? Are we going to have some you know some people think that maybe the molecules that it produces maybe we might have a reaction to like maybe allergies and increase in allergies versus even more serious harm uh, side effects long term and so so there's uh, people at both sides of the camp like very pro very against and anywhere in between um, that question oh, I was just gonna say like with corn when they genetically modify they take out the good part of the corn that's good for you and then they're just leaving the bad part what do you mean I'm just wondering I watched where, a video on it. Like, from what from what source though? I'm just wondering. It was like an educational educated or something. Or not educated. It was like okay. I don't know. It was for nutrition course. Okay. Or something. All right. Well, there's different ways to genetically modify, so maybe yeah. that's you know one company is doing that. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't mean that all of them likes to do. It doesn't mean that all of them, because there are lots of different ways to genetically modify, and there's different seed companies and so on. Like Monsanto, have you heard of that? There's a huge company that modifies um, their crop plants and so on, and so they're in the news a lot. Haven't we like technically been modifying plants since like you know ever since we've been having agriculture? Because I remember seeing the picture of like what corn used to look like before we started growing it, and it was like this little tiny. Like it had a little bit of stuff like that, and now it's just this monstrous. Yeah, before we knew of, about putting genes and things like that and had that much technology, we modified by selectively breeding, basically. So we took traits and from two different plants, brought them, trying to get a combination of good traits, and kept doing that for hundreds of years, and we've actually changed, you're right, the base. That, and that's more natural, all right, but still. But like, um, it's still not like what? What nature would happen in nature? Action, that's, it. that's exactly right. We've done that with pretty much a lot of things. Oh, with dogs. Yes. yes. So, um, <clears throat> yes, yes, we have. Okay. So those are um, uh, another example I want to show you is the salt tolerance. Uh, the, the that they're they're finding that in certain areas we over irrigate the land and um, put too much fertilizer on it and it's causing the soil to become salty which is making it hard to grow plants and so they're um, they've been researching how to make plants salt tolerant and be able to grow in this area that uh, has saltier than normal soil and so what they did is they found a plant that can grow in salt or saltier conditions they found the gene in that plant that allows them to grow. They took the gene out of that plant and put it into a tomato plant. So this is a this is a normal tomato plant. If you, this is growing in salt water, what would happen if it grows in salt water? So the tomato plant is going to die. It, things don't usually it doesn't not usually survive. And this is whoops, go back. This is a tomato plant that has been genetically altered by inserting the gene into it to make it salt tolerant and it's able to survive a lot better. And so, so they're working on that. So that's another practical application of putting in genes from other organisms and getting them to do something we want to do. And in this case is using lands that we normally wouldn't use. All right. And then the last thing I want to talk about is how you genetically engineer plants. And so, <coughs> So, <laughs> um, how do you get the gene? And they found this, this last thing, they found this really cool plasmid in a bacteria called the TI plasmid. 
And what it does is allow us to insert genes into plant cells very easily. And so, so that's what this picture is, this last little picture here, is we have, here's your bacteria. So this is a bacteria. Isolate the plasmid. This is like we did in the paper activity. Use a restriction enzyme to cut it. Let's say this is the salt tolerant gene that I just talked about. So, so this is the salt tolerant gene. We cut out that with the same restriction enzyme so we have the same sticky ends. Mix them together, they're glued together, and now this is our recombinant plasmid. We put the plasmid into, this is a plant cell. This is one plant cell. And what that does is the, this gene gets inserted, the TI plasmid inserts it into the plant's DNA. So this is the salt tolerant gene right now in the plant cell. And then the plant then um, can become salt tolerant. I wanna show you here for plant cell, one plant cell to a plant. This is why it's so easy to do this with plants. Plants have the uncanny ability to, you can, I think I talked a little bit about this before, where you can take one or a couple of cells from a plant, you can genetically change it, and most plant cells have the ability to divide and differentiate into a whole new plant cell. All right, so, um, so therefore, um, uh, to genetically change and get a plant, you can just take a few cells from it, insert the gene, grow a whole new plant. We can't do that with us. We can't take some skin cells from us, genetically engineer, and we don't grow into a, those cells in the lab, won't grow into another human, all right? But plants will do that. So you can do that way like with carrots. Carrots, if you took in the lab and you um, uh, took a few carrot cells and you can insert the gene into them and in the lab, let them divide and they'll grow up into a whole new carrot. Plant. And so that carrot plant would have new genes that it didn't have before. And so the plants are unique that way. They also do the same thing yeah. with uh, orchids. No. Where they, uh, I went to the Chicago Conservatory like two weeks ago. And oh, yeah. They had an entire room of orchids, and you can see on like the labels, they said like this species crossed with this species, crossed with this species. But what they do is they, they combine the DNA because um, some of the species are so different they actually can't like reproduce technically. So um, you can have parts of the plant that are actually like one one flower is this color and like looks like this and the other flower is like this and, well, that's and yeah and it, it, mm -hmm. the colors that they can have are just incredible with, with orchids. Yeah. Very cool. Lucas? So um, is there a certain yeah, so that's where the sequencing, the human genome project is really important. Um, so that, that helps us, you have to kind of know the sequence of the gene, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Then you have to know about all these restriction enzymes and what sequence they look for, and then find the one that best, you know what I mean? So it's a process, yes. So absolutely, so all genes, do they know where every single gene is and how to cut it out? No, no, all right. That takes years of study. So so at universities, they're studying this for a long time, all right? They, somebody might spend a good portion of their career just studying one thing, you know what I mean? All right, okay, and that's that. All right, so let's go through and do a, uh, Synopsis of viruses. Yeah. It's okay, the endosperm is like the fat. Uh, 
like endocytosis where now the capsid comes in and what happens to the capsid? It breaks down. So therefore we have here the capsid, we have all the capsid proteins broken down and that exposes the, the genetic material. Let's say this is an RNA virus. The genetic material is the RNA. So this is RNA inside of it. What is the cell gonna do now? It's gonna be used to make new viruses. How do we do that? Well, a virus is basically the genetic material and the capsid and then the envelope here. So therefore, two pathways. Copy, it makes copies of RNA, so we get many copies of the RNA. And then the RNA can be used to make protein, right? What kind of proteins are in this molecule? There's the capsid proteins as well as what's the second kind for an envelope virus? The glycoproteins on the surface here. So therefore there are, let's look at this, there's, there are, so they make capsid proteins and so they make them to form new capsids like this and then there are the glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are these guys right here. They have to be on the outside. So these guys here are made, the glycoproteins are made on ribosomes on the rough ER. So what does it do? I'm going to use a different color here and so it puts together at the ribosome chains of amino acids, so you're building your protein, and this protein adheres to the inside of your rough ER. So what happens is, is if you remember from the rough ER, that they, they butt off, and you get a butting off the transport vesicle, and so inside the transport vesicle are these glycoproteins. The transport vesicle uses with the cell membrane, and this happens with many transport vesicles. So basically on the outside of the cell membrane now, you have these glycoproteins that are really part of the virus. That's important because when the capsid proteins go around and you make a new capsid and it goes around the RNA, so you have a capsid with RNA, that capsid comes over here and leaves the cell. How does it leave the cell? Exocytosis. I can't really draw this, but the membrane is going to come out and indent or kind of push out and around the capsid. And coming out here, you're going to have your envelope around it, which is really the cell membrane. And inside of it, you're going to have your capsid with your RNA. And now this virus can go and infect another cell. Notice this virus is identical. So that's an envelope virus. Uh, one other kind of envelope virus, just real quickly, is the retrovirus. What does a retrovirus have that um, that that is unique? Reverse, reverse transcriptase. So if this one's an um, uh, reverse transcriptase here. It would make DNA from the RNA, and the DNA would get where? Would put into the host cell.